Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Crossing the Line, Tales from the Entertainment Industry. I'm Charlie Cullicut. And I'm Oliver Rednall. Today, we talk to Gabriel Byrne, actor, writer, and producer, who has appeared in over 80 films, including The Usual Suspects, Miller's Crossing, and more recently, Hereditary. In this episode, we discuss his journey from amateur dramatics in Dublin through to the upper echelons of Hollywood, how modern culture has affected filmmaking, as well as the moral challenges one must face as an actor. He detailed his life in his most recent memoir, Walking with Ghosts. Please make sure to like, subscribe and review on whatever platform you are listening to. Thank you. Gabriel, thank you for joining us today. Oh, happy to be here. Um, the question I wanted to ask first is, when you speak in your book about when you were at the Cannes Film Festival with the usual suspects and you felt this surge of recognition and mm. fame and essentially you got spooked by that and very worried, have you ever had that since then or did that prepare you for the career ahead of you? Um, I, th I think I've always had um, an ambivalent... Uh, perspective on the notion of what it means to be successful because I think there are two kinds of success there's the success that's um, bestowed on you by a public for want of a better word and then there's the inner self which is you, your own definition of mm. what success is um, you can be struggling on Friday and on Monday you have to come to a complete redefinition of who you are because of what's happened over the weekend in terms of say a movie exploding or uh, a, a play being successful and I, I've, I've always felt that the the inner self if for want of a better word, the, the, the fragile self of the, the actor is constantly uh, at variance with this outside uh, expectation of uh, what's, you know, what's demanded of you. Some people are okay with it. Some people crave it more than anything. Um, some people it destroys and it definitely alters uh, as, I, I, as I said in the book not just oneself but the attitude of other people around you and that alters the reality of, of life um, I, I don't think I was equipped to deal with that to be honest um, I thought I knew what was expected and what was involved but it came so suddenly after years of, you know, s success of various kinds, but that kind of overwhelming uh, reaction, um, it did something to me physically and also, I think, emotionally as well. Not everybody reacts like that, as I said, but it was the way I reacted, and it was probably my own emotional makeup that, uh, uh, you know, m made me reassess who I was as a person and who I wanted to be in the business. Mm. And uh, if you hadn't have had that, how do you think that would have changed who you, or how do you think ha how it has changed who you are? If you hadn't have had that, what, how different would you be now? I think that's a difficult question to answer because mm. we can all look back at decisions in our lives and say, well, if I hadn't gone to that school or uh, my parents hadn't moved or whatever, who would I be now? Um, I don't know, honestly, the answer to that. Um, I know that when I came to, um, just uh, very briefly, I, I, I was a teacher until I was 30 years of age, mm -hmm. so I didn't expect to go into acting in a professional way. Um, I had gone into amateur theatre, and I was quite happy there. Mm. And um, by a complete accident, I um, at that time in Dublin, there were no agents. Th th there was no way you could like, m make your way as an actor. You just went into one thing, and then if somebody liked it, you got into the next thing. It was a very haphazard kind of road. 
Yeah, so I was teaching up until the age of 30 or so. And then I um, I was asked to go into a, uh, a, gr- a group, theatre group that was starting in Dublin at that time. It partly came about, that company, because the people who were in it couldn't get into the established theatres because there were certain um, um, requirements to become part of, say, the Abbey Theatre, the Gay Theatre, and so forth. And if you were from a particular part of Dublin you ha- or you hadn't trained in some way, you were regarded as not being worthy to get in. So this started up as a kind of a reaction to that. And it became, uh, in its way, a revolutionary kind of theatre in Dublin at that time. And we put on many um, risque kind of productions. And uh, Jim Sheridan was the director and Neil Jordan directed there as well. And there was a, a, a terrific repertory of uh, really good actors, but the idea of the idea of becoming, of going into film for a start was non-existent. Nobody ever had that ambition because no films were being made in Ireland, and there were no agents. So your you, your your limits were very much defined by the world that you lived in. I mean, your ambitions were defined by the world that you lived in. Um, and John Borman. Um, made Excalibur and quite a few of us got into that film and that was the beginning of um, an awareness of the fact that film possibly might be an ambition though none of us thought that it would ever go beyond those those roles in that film because you said you were learning about screen acting when making that film mm. well I didn't know anything about screen mm. acting at the time and I don't think any of the other actors did either Helen Mirren, maybe, who had, who also had never gone to drama school, mm. Nicole Williamson, these people. There were quite a few established British actors who came into that film, Patrick Stewart mm. and um, a few others. But uh, we'd never been to drama school. We'd never acted on film. We didn't know anything about anything. We had no agents, so we just went into this thing and thought, okay, well, we got away with another day. Uh, hopefully we won't be fired tomorrow. That was kind of the attitude. So uh, that came out, and the the movie was a success, but it didn't really do anything for any of us. Um, but I had, in the meantime, been in a series that was broadcast on Irish television, which was uh, a success for me. And it was seen by an English agent. And I came over to London. And although I'd had some degree of success in the theatre in Dublin and uh, television, when I came to London, it was starting at the bottom, auditions. But the difference was that you had to fly from Dublin to London Mm. to audition. So I had to save up the money for a flight. And sometimes if I didn't have the money, uh, I couldn't do the audition. So, you know, we were talking earlier about self-tapes. That was... Th- that phenomenon was absolutely unimaginable that time. You had to get on a plane in Dublin, fly over to the RSC, do these ridiculous auditions for these people who sat with this air of detached, almost boredom, like next. And then you would go in and you'd have been preparing the, r- the thing for, you know, days and so forth. And you were expected to deliver a full performance right there and then in the room. There was never any allowance made for nerves or um, uh, tripping on lines or anything like that. So um, I spent quite a lot of time in London um, auditioning. And I found the whole process itself, the auditioning process, demoralizing I um, I just didn't I just didn't feel for me anyway that I could do th- that I could deliver a uh, something that I felt was real in the room because oftentimes you're reading opposite a, 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 an assistant 
who read blankly from a page as you were trying to emote with this person mm. and they were just sitting looking at you. And I just th thought this was completely unnatural. And I never did well in the world of auditions at all. Um, I still regard it as, uh, uh, even though, as I said, I haven't auditioned for uh, since Miller's Crossing in 1990. Um, I feel sorry for people who have to do it. Um, even with the world of self-tape, uh, it's an unnatural process. My, I think Mike Lee made the point, maybe it was on your show, that um, how do you get to know the person? Mm. How do you get to know the, r the reality, the energy, the, the soul of the person I if you're forcing them into 10 minutes of an audition of something they've learned of that they have to do in the room at that moment? You can tell a great deal more from somebody by just talking to them sometimes than you can in terms of getting them to do. So I'm, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but it was a tough time. And it was a time when it looked as if uh, nothing was going to happen. What that process taught me was um, that you falling into uh, hopelessness and despair about the future is an option that you don't want to, to pursue because it has a direct effect on on your psyche and on, on, on the life that you live. Things do change. And in my particular case, one day, um, this was after about 11 months of no auditions, no work, no nothing. I, I had actually stopped telling people I was an actor because it was just too embarrassing because they'd say, well, what have I seen you in? I said, well, I, nothing really. Mm. Um, so um, That's us now. Yes, <laughs> I was about to say that. It's been longer than 11 months, but uh, it's yeah. all good. But I think that's the story yeah. of 99% of, of course, actors. Yeah. One day, completely out of the blue, I got two auditions in the same afternoon. 10 minutes from each other. Yeah. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> right. Um, so I went in uh, to the first one, which was the, the American director, uh, Michael Mann, who mm -hmm. afterwards did um, Heat. Heat, yeah. and, and he was making a film at uh, Pinewood. And I knew the lines backwards. And he's, when I went in, he said, For, forget the lines. Just you know, improvise around it, and uh, which I, I was able to do. Um, and then I went to the other audition. And so I forgot about it for about three or four days, as much as one can forget an audition, because y you wait for the phone to ring. Mm. And it turned out that I got both roles. Really? After all that <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> both roles, and then I had to decide which one I need. I, I I I should do. So that was another form of torture of saying if I do that and I do this and I do that. And anyway, I did what I thought was the right decision. The the Michael Mann movie was with uh, Ian McKellen and a few other people that I admired, and I said, okay, well I'll do that one. And um, I'm not going to tell you what the other film okay, was but sure. the other film went on to be a success and this one didn't do mm -hmm. so well okay but um the lesson there is that first of all you know never give up because you don't know when the phone is going to ring metaphorically and secondly even when it does ring uh that is not the end of the the journey mm -hmm. you know it's in many ways the beginning of a journey that you have probably hadn't even predicted so um, that involved choices. Do I choose to do this or do I choose to do that? The most difficult thing, and I think I was saying this um, um, before, the most difficult thing, I think, for, a, for an actor, a young actor, is how you take care of yourself when you're not working goes back to that idea of allowing yourself to become disappointed, um, th then hopelessness, despair, depression, all those things that we 
as fragile human beings are, you know, uh, we're subject to them more, especially as actors, I mm. think, um, that you have to have tremendous resilience of spirit to say, okay, this isn't working today, but maybe in a week's time it'll be a different story. And as you know, the business is full of people who had to, you know, be out in the wilderness for quite a while and then suddenly w one thing happens and it changes their lives. But it's true even now today. Like the thing that you have to really pay attention to is your own uh, your own psychology. Um, stay positive. Be interested in other things. Um, stay fit. Um, don't, as much as possible, don't allow doubt to get into the equation, because these are imagined things. Mm -hmm. You know, if I d and then I uh, stay ready, stay fit, stay psychologically healthy as possible, and have faith that the thing will change. And even if it doesn't change there's a road that's opening up um, and your projections now are unreliable about that. There's, there's ambition and there's hope and the, the, the two and faith and the, t and, and they kind of go together. But, um, I've known quite a few actors who have gone off the rails in between jobs and it hasn't served them well when the jobs came back around. So um, take care of yourself, uh, I would say, is one of the most important lessons I learned in, in this business. Mm. I remember a story in your book where you were collecting your dole money, was it, in the yeah. morning? And in the afternoon you were flying to Venice to make a film. So it sort of changed just really, really quickly. Yeah, I, I, I will always remember that morning. I went down to Camden Town Dole office. And as I think I said in the book, they had this little pencil that was tied with a string to the bars so that you couldn't run away with a little <laughs> stub of a pencil. Um, and um, when I got back, uh, there was no emails or texts or at that time my girlfriend was saying, they want you in Venice. I, I, I thought Venice it made a veil. What, what, what's <laughs> that? Uh, and... Um, that afternoon, I was on a, I was on a plane to to Venice to do a, a, a small role, but um, a, it was kind of um, a meaningful job for me mm. at that time. And um, again, that proved to me. In the morning, it was one thing; in the afternoon, it was another. Yeah. The two worlds were completely mm. uh, s separate. Um, yeah, so you just never know. Mm. It's where you worked with Richard Burton, wasn't mm. it? Do, uh, you, do you think with actors these days, I mean, this is a generalisation, but do you feel we're missing the sort of dangerous young actors, not dangerous in a dangerous way, but the kind of hell raises and the, the rebels? Do you think we're missing that with today's sort of sanitised society? Yeah, that's a good question. Personally, I don't think so. No. I think the image of the hell raiser often... Um, was another um, way of saying chronic alcoholic. Mm. A lot of those men were that. And they came to prominence at a time when that kind of rebellious behavior was admired. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a difference between rebellious behavior that requires courage mm -hmm, and course. rebellious behavior that, you know, is about, you know, Recklessness, uh, and, re yeah. recklessness, and um, a lot of those men, you know, and I worked with all, all of them. I mean, they died young, mm -hmm. and they sacrificed themselves to the myth of that roaring boy kind of image. Dylan Thomas, Brendan Bean, uh, Richard Burton, Richard Harris, Oliver Reed, Oliver Reed yeah. all those guys. Um, and they became parodies, sad parodies in some cases of, of their former selves because you look at somebody like Oliver Reed who I did work with as well. 
was maybe one of the most exciting young actors of the 60s. And when you think of what he became, mm. he became what he became because of his drinking. Mm. Um, I think in order to be a successful actor, I think you have to be disciplined. And you have to be disciplined across the board. Um, I don't think there's a toleration for that kind of behavior much uh, anymore. It's certainly not as admired of uh, as it was, you know, in 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 their time. In the sixties, I think something happened in relation to certainly in in terms of British acting, because British society is very much about class. If you look at the kind of actor there was before, say, nineteen sixty-two, it was very much a stylized. Mm. Um, Rada type mm. acting, and um, that uh, that changed in 1962. With, I suppose, initially, the wave of working class literature mm. that came out with Alan Sillitoe mm. and Stan Barstow and people like that, John Osborne, John like Osborne, that, yeah. they made films of those, so they required working class actors. So you had the emergence of people like Albert Finney and Alan Bates and Burton and those people, and they changed what an actor could be working class actors then became fashionable mm. and the other type of acting kind of went out of fashion um, I think I think young actors now have a different attitude I think to the business at that time say when those men were, were were coming up, there was this there was a hierarchy. You came out of drama school, you went to a repertory company, and and y you toured with that repertory company for two or three years, whatever it was. Pinter was a, a, a traveling player, Qu and and you got to do various plays, and then you went into the West, and then you went to the BBC, and if you were lucky, you you got into films. Well, that kind of a journey doesn't exist anymore. Um, a lot of young actors now say, well, okay, I'm an actor and I'm going to L.A. I'm going to Hollywood. That's where my ambition lies. Not everybody, but it certainly looks an easier jump across the pond than it, than it did before. And with the success of actors, it looks like, b British and, and Irish actors, it looks now like it's an easier jump than it possibly could be and it, br it it brings up the notion of what is your ambition as an actor you know what what do you want to be do you, do, do you want to be um do you want to be a hollywood actor or do you want to be um an actor who works in theater television film um and has a different kind of life um so again, going back to my own journey, nobody ever talked about ambition. Ambition was kind of a dirty word. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't talk about what it is that you that you wanted to do. I certainly didn't have an ambition to go to Hollywood. I didn't even think that w it was a possibility. So therefore, it wasn't even on, on my radar. But it's now an acceptable journey for many, ma many young actors uh, to go straight from... Uh, drama school in Dublin or London to film mm. stardom. But of course film itself has changed. Mm. I mean as you were, when you were talking to Mike Lee, I mean Mike Lee put it very succinctly when, when he was on this on this show and he talked about the the huge gap now between franchise pictures and um, mm. independent small mm. independent films. I remember hearing you talk about In the Name of the Father and mm. how that was the budget on that, that would be sort of like middle ground, but now mm. you probably wouldn't be able to make it for that, maybe. It, it, it's even debatable if you'd be able to make that film. Mm. Mm. Um, so do you think we're missing potential great films because of because of this division? Well, I think so. I think um, the corporatization of everything from football uh, to, to films um, has not been a great thing. There's a monopoly now on the people, uh, you know, of people who make films and have the money to make them. Netflix, Amazon, even the big studios are beginning to lose their uh, their their power. They don't seem interested in making mid mid budget films anymore or, or low budget films. It's about can you get an idea that you can 
keep making spin-offs mm. of in perpetuity. You look at that kind of entertainment and you say, well, that that is more or less what fills the multiplexes. And I think we don't look at films critically. We don't look at television critically, and we certainly don't look at the news critically enough. Um, and movies carry within them um, messages and ideas and a, a morality about the world that we sometimes don't question. And those kinds of unexamined, uncritical images come into the way we think about politics and entertainment and, and so forth. You know, when George Bush talked about you know, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. He was appealing in a way to the mythology of mm -hmm. uh, Westerns and so forth, where there was a good guy and a bad guy. It, things were very, very simple. In the sense of like the cowboy and the Indian. The cowboy, yeah. the, the good cowboy, the bad cowboy, yeah. the, the, you know, the Indian on horseback who had no lines, just screamed into mm -hmm. camera shot and, was, you know, shot down that simplistic world of the good guy versus the bad guy, he was able to call on that mythology through people's exposure to that kind of message in film. Um, and um, we're looking now, as we speak now, about the, the, the chaos of Afghanistan, but the people who caused it are blaming other people. Mm. Blair and Bush are the ones who were responsible mm. for that. Uh, to begin with. Um, but it was very difficult when you read the papers the, about the Falklands in the, in, in the 80s when I was here and Afghanistan and um, uh, Iraq to be uh, against those uh, invasions because um, to a certain extent, and I'm only talking about films here, to a certain extent, the ground had been prepared through the kinds of films that were being made about the kind of morality that war, mm. uh, you know, that war is about. And if you look at a film, say, like Unforgiven, that was mm. really, it was 92, that was mm. really a film that blurred those lines. Mm. That was really only one of all the Westerns, really, mm. that kind of did that. Mm. Well, w w the Western film is a mythology. Mm. Um the the reality of what life was like in the old west uh was about genocide mm. that's hardly ever mm. ever addressed so um the movies that tell the truth about the reality of the world as it is or as it was are becoming fewer and fewer they're becoming more and more marginalized because when I look at sometimes the, 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 the big franchise pictures as well and I say to myself, what are these things actually saying? Uh, the idea that one person is going to come in and save the world, a, a Spider-Man or, uh, you know, one of these things will come in and save people, Superman. The real significance of that is that we come to believe that as a precept, mm. that we will be saved from the outside. It'll be Obama or it'll be you know, Biden or whatever. And what you have is a helpless collect uh, population waiting for this. Hap the, the only thing that will change anything is collective action, not, not relying on one individual. But that's what I mean about the subtlety and the insidiousness of messages in, in films, that we don't look at them critically enough. And so that b brings you to another question, like, J just as we talked about choice for an actor, Wh what choices do you make as an actor? Because that that also ties into one's ambition as well. Because do we know ourselves enough to be able to say what kind of decisions and choices we would make? I, do, I don't think that we do. Um, uh, for example, if you, if, if you were in a, a, a plane crash and you survived and the plane is on fire and would you be the kind of person who would go back in and pull somebody out or would you be somebody who just said I'm safe I'm okay let me get out of here you would like to think you were the person who went mm -hmm. back in but 
would you really be? You don't know. So when the reality of a career choice comes up, what kind of a person are you going to be there? It can be very difficult to turn down money. Mm. It can be very difficult to overturn your own sense of what you believe is right in the world to say, there's a lot of money in this and this could really, I'll do this. And it'll open you up to do other things, yes. whether that be produce like you have mm. uh, with a couple of the movies. I actually want to talk about that. Mm. You've produced a number of movies mm. over, of your cr- over your career in the name of the father, mm. Last of the High Kings, most recently Hereditary. Mm. Is that because of your desire to have choice to be able to tell stories that you want to tell or a different perspective? Um, yes, up Yes, up to a point. I, I've never been interested in producing, you know, full time as a, a Hollywood type producer. It's just so difficult to do it. But there were issues that I felt strongly about. I, I've I've had more films rejected as a producer than I, you know, succeeded in in getting made. I mean, in the name of the father. Um, was it taught me something important about this business. I was on the way from Heathrow to New York and I found this book, which was the book of In the Name of the Father. I think it was called Presumed Guilty or Presumed Innocent, I can't remember. But it was in a, a, a 50% off wire basket and I took it out and I read it. And I thought, this, is a, this isn't just about the Guilford Four and the appalling... Um, miscarriage of justice there but this is this is actually a story about what the notion of justice is what is justice um and so i went about getting the movie made and we 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 got it made and it was an influential it was an influential film um but it taught me two things number one that you can actually instigate things yourself that you can escape from under the tyranny of being told w- what to do. Mm. Uh, can you actually uh, do things that you believe in yourself and get them done and get them made? Again, it's not waiting for somebody else to come in and say, you should do this. Uh, this is a good thing. It's saying, I'm going to do this. And um, it taught me that. Uh, and then I, I, I got a producing deal at um, Miramax when Harvey Weinstein was there. I made three films with them, but I took a, um, I, I, I took another producing um, deal at um, uh, MGM, hmm. and. I had an office and I had secretaries and I had everything and every every script that I br- brought to them, they didn't want to do. So I realized that uh, this was really not going to go anywhere. But also in a position where you thought you would have choice. I you still have people who yes. are saying, no, you can't have that. Yeah, yeah, no, those people say, no, we don't want to do that. Mm. And looking back on it, I think some of the ideas that I had were way before their time. Mm. Um, why do you think producers are like that? You hear these stories all the time of saying no, 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 no. They tend to be the m- the money people behind it. Why why aren't they? Of course, money is the driving force for them. But why don't they get more artistically driven people in that? Is it because of the responsibility of the financial return they need to make? Yeah, I don't think Hollywood was ever about making artistic films. It's uh, art doesn't mean anything to them. Um, and I say art in a very loose way. Mm-hmm. It's a product. It's a product to make money. Hollywood is a factory. And the product that the factory uh, turns out is called film. And so you hedge your bets and you don't take risks because the product, you have to sell the product to the widest possible widest possible audience. If an artistic film gets out by accident, it'll be by accident. It won't be because they say, oh, this is a wonderful film. I'm talking generally speaking now. Mm-hmm. This is something that will... They look at it and they say, 
What's where, the market? Where, where, for yeah, this? where's what's the market for this? And it's always been like that. Um, so that's why the world of independent film is so important because that wasn't so dependent on whether it made a profit or not. It was about what, to a large extent, what the actual product was. So is that why you got behind something, so, so a recent film, Hereditary, which mm. was a first-time director, mm. uh, a story which r really is very different to what you usually hear because usually in a horror movie, at the end of the day, they win, they survive, mm. whatever, whereas mm. this film, spoiler alert for those who haven't mm. watched it, they don't. Mm. And was that just one of those of, I want to see something different and... Or did it come into like your own experience with spirituality or uh, religion? I think I met I met with Ari Aster, and I realized that he was an exceptional filmmaker. The way he talked about the kinds of films that he wanted to make, because he's a subversive filmmaker. Mm. So he'll, he'll he'll give you ostensibly the product, but underneath it is something else, as many, many great filmmakers have had to do. They give you what you want, but underneath it is something else. Mm. They learn how to use the genre to make their own particular um, points of view. Um, it was very obvious from watching his short films, and he began in the same way, nobody's gonna give me any money to do this, so I'll do this myself, and I'll make these, or I'll write these things, and and filmed them, and bit by bit, and A24 uh, got on board and you know gave him the money. But it was obvious he had a different, a really original take on m making these kinds of um, horror films. Um, but um, I think, again, it goes back to this point. He was another guy who instigated his own career, mm. did not wait for people to come along and say, okay, here's what you have to do. You have to, he, he believed in what he had enough to say, I'm gonna take the risk to make sure, to, to, to ensure that I can make the kind of material, now he's in a position where he can. If you were coming to the business now, how would you navigate your way through this? What different choices would you make or what direction would you, would you go in, talking about the sort of big franchises and the choices you have to make sort of morally? Well, one of the big differences that I've noticed is that um, young actors now, some of them get cast on the uh, on their social mm -hmm. media mm -hmm. profile. That to me is uh, un unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Why w why would you cast somebody because they have, you know, ten thousand people who follow them? Why would you put them in a film if they can't act? Mm -hmm. Or maybe they can act, but they're going to get the job over somebody who doesn't have that amount of social media following. Um, I think you told me before that there was a guy who got a job because he'd blown up like the day before on yeah. social media yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that to me is incomprehensible. Like I, I, I'm still naive enough to believe that you know the best actor gets the job, but that is not the case. Um, I how would I negotiate it? I have no idea because the business has changed so much. Um, we talked about monopolies earlier on. I mean, th the place of the actor in these things. I have to say that I don't know if actors really are respected for what they do. By the business or by audiences? By the business. By the business. Mm. I don't know how much... I've certainly been told by directors that actors are the last thing that I've thought about when it comes to making a production, mm. assuming they're not Leonardo DiCaprio right. or something like that. Right. Well, they, they need a Leonardo DiCaprio to get the money mm -hmm. to yeah, make the film. Exa exactly. But, but beyond that... Um, I think they think actors are interchangeable. Mm. I, I'm I, I'm generalizing now, mm. but um, I think it's particularly tough now for a young actor starting off. 
I, I, I think going back to what we said earlier on, that you have to have tremendous inner resilience. And you have to look, I think, at every aspect of your own personality. There are actors that I've worked with who I know are way too fragile for this business. Mm -hmm. There are actors I've worked with who I don't think should be in it at all. Mm. Do they tend to be younger actors? Uh, younger and older. Mm -hmm. And women, young girls. Um, the business is not kind to women. Mm -hmm. Even now in the post sort of Me Too movement? No. Really? No. Do you think that's been, that, that should have had a better effect on that? More positive effect? I think it's a different... Um, the question is, do movies reflect the world that's out there? Or um, or do they dictate the kind of world to a great extent that we live in? Movies are a reflection, I think, of the way we see the world. Um, the way women are perceived is reflected in film. It's very hard for an actress over the age of 40 to think about um, a career that's sustained. Mm -hmm. Very, very few actresses at a certain level, uh, you know, maintain their their status. Very, very few. Writers don't write for women over a certain age. They don't write for men over a certain age. They don't write for um, uh, to a great extent for the reality of the world that's out there. Um, Why is that, do you think? get product again selling yeah 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 or could it be a lack of experience because we it's one of those of you know catch 22 we don't see it therefore we don't write it therefore we don't see it mm -hmm. therefore we don't hear about it mm -hmm. over and over yeah um i would say that um the challenges that an actor faces over a career change as time goes on F first of all you're you're trying to get a job and you audition and you're rejected and that's the thing how do you deal with that rejection do you turn that in on yourself and say oh i can't be any good if they rejected me a rejection is a rejection it doesn't mean that it's personal mm -hmm. so you've got to you've got to say are they rejecting me or um d w were they looking for something completely different in the role uh, to hold on to your sense of self in in the face of that rejection is something that never goes away as an actor. No matter how successful you become, it never actually goes away completely, because there are various challenges that you face as your as your career goes on. Um, so, um, you know the, the the that old thing of the five stages of an actor, like um, who's 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 Joe Smith. We want Joe Smith. We want a Joe Smith type. Uh, where's Joe Smith? Who, who's Joe Smith? You know, um, so planning a career as much as one possibly can for the long term is also sh should be part of the of the strategy as well. But I think um, those challenges that you have to face then of getting older, of being um, typecast, there's so many things that you have to look at. I have a friend who's an actor who signed a seven-year deal with a television, uh, for a television show. And I completely understood why he took it. Seven years, don't have to worry about going for other jobs, I get really well paid, I'll be in the same place, I can send my kids to school, um, it'll give me the power to... After a year, he hated the job. And he was in it for seven years. It's like what you said about the morality thing, it's not always yeah. what you think it is. You can you then have to deal with the good side, but then with yeah. that comes the yeah. responsibility. Yeah. It looks fairly simple, yeah. the trajectory looks very simple. But it's oh. always a shade of grey. There's always a shade of grey. You choose your suffering to a degree. Yeah, and it's you in the middle of that, it's you. That, that's why I think that you, like, we have to define the ambition, define what it is that we want. Um, because he's miserable. Um, people who want to be 
great theater actors who have to make the decision to say, I want to stay in the theater. Mm. Stay away from me with any kind of offers that might tempt me. This is what I want to do with my life. Um, so, yeah. Um, I don't know how I would how I would counsel a young a young actor, except to say. Rather than going ab talking about the career, understanding how the business actually works and the impersonality and the mercilessness and the ruthlessness of the business itself, understanding yourself within that business keeps going back to the same thing, taking care of yourself. How important is this to your happiness, to your contentment in life? Will you be a will, will you be a discontented person if these ambitions don't happen? Who are you when you're not doing this job? Who are you if this job doesn't materialize? Mm -hmm. They're tough questions to mm -hmm. ask. I was about to say they're they're ones that you do have to pause and go. Yes. What is the mm. is there a correct answer to this? Um, it's ever changing, I guess. Yeah. It, it is ever changing, but the the process of self examination goes on anyway, uh, no matter what job you're in. Do you uh, think social media has disrupted that? It's been more about the facade of what we put forward, especially in this business, well rather than self-examination. Gabriel said it before about yeah. people getting offered the jobs, mm. but in the sense of self, in the sense of self um, critique and self inward and examination. I don't know that it's ever been any different, really. Um, the the trajectories and the hierarchies are different now. It, to a certain extent, the actor now in this time is in unknown territory. Mm -hmm. Like the thing that we're shooting at the moment, um, you know, uh, we've shot some of it in Wales, but they'll say, they'll bring in this huge green screen and they'll say, that's London. We'll put that in in post. Mm -hmm. And you think, there was a time when that was unimaginable. Mm -hmm. That London would be. I I did a film in Los Angeles a few years ago where they recreated New York on a soundstage. Really? Yeah. Uh, taxis, st uh, buildings, steam coming up out of the ground, people walking through streets, and you think, well, hmm, if they can do that, will there come a time in this world when they have therapy robots and uh, people who have relationships with their uh, with their um, avatars mm. will there come a time when the actor himself will be more or less um, redundant mm. I don't know that's the world that we yeah. face okay. because w actors are also we are part of this new emerging technology and what's our role in that well I was going to say that they started I think Star Wars was doing it most recently, digitally recreating mm. uh, actors who have either passed away yes. or um, making older actors. They did it with Sam Jackson. Mm. Peter Cushing, didn't they? they yeah, did it within um, the making them younger. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in what was in The Irishman, mm -hmm. um, where they digitally made them younger yes. so they would fit in with this story instead yeah. of just finding... Yes a new potential yes. actor to fill in the role. I think there's also areas for experimentation. It's a new technology. Oh, it course. might be something that they go, it was a bit of a fad. Mm. Mm. So obviously that's yet to be discovered. Y yeah. Um, in that case, in the in relation to the Irishman, it was a, te it was a technology that drew attention to itself. Mm. Mm. You kept looking at it and saying, wow, that's amazing what they can do. D it wasn't entirely convincing to me. No. But... Um, we look back on that and say that was a crude version of what we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, that I don't know if you've seen that thing where they morph mm, deep that fake, yeah. deep fake. Like uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's 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 an unknown. Well, it's going to get people in trouble. Mm. It's going to have to be policed. Yeah, to a point. Be. Yeah, because yeah. otherwise you're going to be go. Well, I'll put your face on mine, and yeah. then I'll do a video saying. Yeah. 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 But the whole notion of truth, anyway, has 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 been splintered. Mm. We don't know now actually what is true mm. and what is not true. 
Um, sometimes it doesn't matter to people. And it doesn't matter. Yeah. That, oh, that, that's a whole... Well, yeah. you know, <laughs> there are men who prefer fake breasts. Yeah. They just do. And will there come a time when people won't remember what, um, you know, wh wh what uh, the real thing was mm. when they've established a relationship with the fake? Mm. What happens if that is the way that film is going to go? And it's odd because we've, we've had these stories for years and years that have challenged this idea, yet we're still doing it to ourselves anyway. Yeah, sort of self-perpetuating. And they keep pointing out. Yeah, they it make a film and it's like, yeah, yeah well, you know, that's, that's terrible, but thing. let's do this. Yeah, and yeah. then they make go ahead and make well, it. Well, what do you guys feel about being in this new uncharted landscape? Um, Personally, I, I find myself... Are you talking about... I'm quite... Like so sorry, Charlie, you carry on. Uh, yeah. Are you talking about in relation to how I am perceived or how no, I... No, how you feel about embarking on this career as a young actor in this changing landscape do you want to go first i th I, th I personally find it hard it is it like the really simple way that doesn't explain it properly but it, there seem to be so many hurdles that you or appear to not have been there in past years or like so like social media like, like what so social, social media social media being there uh, constant kind of people watching you, camera phones. Uh, you know, you talked earlier about these uh, rebellious types, um, you know, who could do that, but if they were to do that in this modern day society, right. like you said, it would never be allowed. Mm. We're having actors who are very much famous names suddenly being found out for things they did however many mm. years ago and being taken apart, agents dropping them. Mm. Um, so personally, you know, I, f I find myself constantly watching what I'm saying, what's being recorded, what's put online. I try not to post that much when it goes online because I find myself going, maybe I'll say something here that's perfectly fine in this scenario and mm. this time. And then in, in the wrong 20 years time, I'm being told, Charlie, you used the word gay here. Mm. Apologize, otherwise mm. we will ruin your mm. career and life. Mm. But I mean, in terms of being... Um, an an actor, um, what what wh what are the difficulties and the the the, um, bar the obstacles that you talked about? I'd say the sheer number of people. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of. The, you mean the number of people who want to become who want actors? To become actors who put themselves out as actors who find any sort of fame as an ability to have a platform, which then overshadows people who have trained to have work to have and I, uh, yeah i think giving people everyone uh, not just actors in everyone included an outlet which is social media and you can use it as much as you want or as little as you want people are putting more and more of a facade out there and they're using it because they can't get it here so they're selling their soul for want of a better phrase in order to get noticed and things aren't always that good things that are created aren't always that good but i think when someone latches onto it and they say it's good everyone believes it's good and i don't always think it is i think it, again when you need to look at yourself you need to look at things critically and that's not happening i'm quite suspicious of large corporations as i've got older i've become less and less interested in trying to get roles and i've become a lot more i feel better in myself as an actor i feel more confident and more this is what i really really want to do like i look back on films and i watch a lot of films and study film and it's become this is I know why I'm here rather than just I speak to some actors and it depresses me they don't know who certain people are and, and you know ignorance isn't always a bad thing there's always a learning process but if you're in this business it's kind of I think it's the only business you can get or not get away with but be forgiven for not knowing about things if you speak to an 11 year old who supports Manchester United he knows everything about Manchester United you speak to an actor who doesn't know who Martin Scorsese is I'm like well, where have you been I, I know an actor who didn't know who Stanley Kubrick was and I was like, how have you avoided this? Even if you didn't search out, how have you avoided this? Like, where have your eyes been? Mm. Do you not know this film? Like, what are you doing here? And that, mm. I, what so inspires you? Yeah, my ambition really is to work with good people. And I mm. think you get good things from working with good people. Mm. And I don't think that is very common. I think when you find it, it's great. It's really great, but I don't think it's that common. It's not common enough. I agree. There's so much noise and just people not really saying... 
what they really think. And it doesn't mm. even have to be anything. It's not even extreme. It's just, again, gray areas. Like how about this idea? A lot of people don't like you saying you don't know. You either have to be on this side of the fence or this side of the fence because mm. they need to know what box you're in. Mm. And if you're not in that box, then you're an unknown and you're an enemy. But mm. I mean, I don't really worry about the sort of cancel culture thing as much, but I'm, I'm, I don't ever expect it to happen to me. But when you, you do have to think, it's the thinking is the, is the problem because, you know, you normally you wouldn't do or say anything untoward, but it's the, it's the sort of overshadowing worry of, are you thinking there's the wrong thing or saying well, that's, the wrong that's thing? That's interesting what you just said there, Charlie. It's, it sounds almost like an idea that you, you have to police yourself. Mm, yeah. Mm. Which is a, a, um, a very subtle kind of authoritarianism. Mm. They don't even have to do it to you. No. You're doing it to yourself. Mm. I better be careful what I say and who I offend and, and uh, am, am I saying the right thing? Mm. Um, I think that's true of the larger culture. Mm. And it kind of goes off what Ollie was saying there about not having an opinion on something and mm. saying I don't have the information mm. to give mm. you an answer mm. is seen as an attack. Yeah, it's suspicious. People yeah. don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and everyone has an opinion on everything. A new thing comes along. It's the new thing in the news, but... Suddenly everyone's an expert. Yeah, that's right. And I, I just become exhausted by it. And you try and avoid it, and it's sometimes unavoidable. And in it's, it's, an, it's in our entertainment, so it's kind of shoved down your throat a little bit. Yeah. And, in, and I might even agree with it, but I mm. might not want it delivered in a such a dogmatic way yeah um people get outraged over things for a couple of days mm. Wh whatever it happens to be mm. it, there's an avalanche of outrage about it mm. until the next thing comes along that they can be mm. outraged about mm. yeah you say about um people are too fragile to be in this business I'm like, if you're angry by that perhaps this isn't the place for yeah. you mm. maybe well i think that's one of the most honest and one of the most powerful questions that somebody can ask it's a tremendously courageous mm. thing to face to look into the mirror and say is this the business for mm. me mm. am i the kind of person whose potential is going to be limited by being in this business um is my individuality going to be erased or swamped by the necessities and demands of it is this the is this the right thing for me? D can I deal with rejection over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. um, can I deal with what's perceived as failure? Mm -hmm. Like I, you're talking about, you know, you're you're on this side of the fence or that side of the fence. Success and failure are the good guy and the bad mm -hmm. guy. You're either this or you're that. Well, that, in my opinion is is false because mm. there are many degrees of success and there are many kinds of failure that are not actually perceived as failures mm. but were not, but are not actually failures the only kind of real success um i think is the success of contentment mm. to be accepting of this is th th this is the life that i have and i accept it and i'm content with it there's a lot of people i have seen over many many years of being in this business who have really suffered being in this business mm. suffered because their ambitions weren't fulfilled because they had been um, um they've been in the wrong place at the wrong time and things didn't work out for them you can go from there to there in a couple of days mm. um i turned down a movie that won another actor in an academy award mm. And you have to look at that and say that was a decision I made. That was a choice I made, and I have to I have to live with it. And it's okay, and it's fine, and I got through it. Um, after you know a couple of months of <laughs> saying, "What the hell did I do that for?" Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, I I've constantly asked myself, you know, uh, who am I in this business? Mm. I'm I'm getting older now. I realize that, you know, the the time I have left as an actor is much shorter than the time that's gone before. You look at the actors who are a generation before me who are the most successful ones. What are they doing? These were guys who were at the top of their game 15 years ago, mm -hmm. who are now moving into obscurity again and doing work that they would not have done. Uh, earlier on so um, 
I constantly look at myself critically in that way mm. and um I the book the, 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 that I wrote was was about time. Mm. That's really what that book is about. Mm. Um how do you use your time? Um how do you maximize your own potential? How 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 honest are you about yourself? Um we tend to keep our secret ambitions secret and not really let anybody know what your really secret ambition is. Um, but I think part of the process of self-examination is looking into that mirror and saying, who am I and who do I want to be? And will this business that I'm in help to make me the kind of person who will be happy with myself. Mm. And you don't have to be getting 50 million mm -hmm. uh, a movie. Um, you, you can be incredibly fulfilled and incredibly happy doing the kind of work that you want to do and not being told by somebody else what it is that you have to strive for. And you blindly just go along striving for that. Um, so, you know, you can buy a little book, Andy Nyman's book about mm. being an actor, and you can read through that and say, well, that's the business. I've read these 50 pages. That's the business. The other business that I've been, that we've been talking about since the beginning is about oneself. Has mm -hmm. holding on to that notion kept you grounded throughout this business? Because you've been in it a long time now, and, and, you, and you're very grounded, very humble, has, and you don't often see that. Is, is that what's kept you in that place? I'd certainly say on top of that, there are plenty of big names out there who are very much surrounded by yes-men, entourage, mm -hmm. all that. How have you managed to avoid that on top? Uh, because I've never really believed in that artificial uh, definition of, of oneself. When I went to Hollywood, first of all, um, it was incredible how quickly they wanted me to change in the sense that almost unknown to me, uh, unbeknownst to me, I, I was having to make these decisions. You need, you need a manager to keep an eye on the agent. I used to think it was simple. You had an agent and the agent said, oh, there's a role here. Do you want to look mm, at this yeah. script? No, you need a manager who now reads the script that the agent doesn't have time to read. Then you have a lawyer mm -hmm. who negotiates the contract, who keeps an eye on what the manager and the lawyer are doing. Then you need a publicist uh, because you have to be doing the right shows and the right interviews and all, all that stuff. And then you need, uh, there's somebody else that's missing from that equation. A lawyer, a manager, a publicist. So many. <laughs> <laughs> <Huh>? So many. <laughs> yeah, but b before you know it, um, y your salary goes up. Mm. But then you say, well, there's 50% of that gone in tax anyway yeah. for a start. 55% gone. And then you have to pay all those people. So people are looking at these wages and thinking to themselves... So when they say they get paid fifty million, they're yeah. only getting well. Well, 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 you, you will realistically look at that. Mm. The manager gets fifteen, the agent gets ten. That's twenty five percent. The publicist, oh, a business manager, business manager to manage your money to put it in the right stocks and bonds and so forth. So when you look at it and you get something like twenty million, um, which sounds like an, an unbelievable amount of money. That's already nine million before you've even, mm -hmm. you know, and then take paying all those people, you're left with a percentage of that twenty million. So you're S a team almost. A team. So the team has to be. Again, the right? team has yeah. to be paid. Um, then there are people who say, "Well, my hairdresser, my makeup <laughs> person, my uh, bodyguard, all these yeah. things." Um, these things you start off wanting to be an actor mm. because you love being an actor, mm. and you're suddenly in this position where all these, and then of course there's things like, um, um, which I was told, um, oh, you know I know this woman who's really good. She could do like that little thing you have here in your forehead. Ah, okay. the, oh, the, 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 so be. 
that that reality was there in front of me. I'm not saying that I was Leonardo DiCaprio, but I was coming there, and this was the world that I was contemplating. For a man who began in amateur theater, I was mm. now looking at these decisions that had to be made. And I thought to myself, I don't, why do I need a manager? Mm. Let me read the script myself. Mm. Um, why do I need a publicist? I don't actually care. I'm not interested in being on chat shows mm. or uh, whatever. Why do I need um, you know, somebody to look at? And plastic surgery. And not doing that job. And doing this job rather than... so. You, you start to think of yourself, you either play that game and become the commodity. I'm not talking about everybody here. I'm just saying that this is where you go if you go into Hollywood. So that forces you again to look at yourself and say, do I want this? Mm -hmm. Is this who I want to be? Or am I content to do this job and not that job and not have all those people and not have that uh, gigantic salary? Um, but that's just my experience of yeah. going to Hollywood. I'm not saying that people don't go to Hollywood and have a great time and love that mm. and have turned it to their... But, you know, from my point of view, I did not want to go down that road. Mm. Our final question we ask everyone is, is there a film that you're ashamed you haven't seen? I regard the process of educating myself in film as an ongoing one. Mm. Mm -hmm. And there are so many directors that I haven't seen um that I would be a little bit ashamed that I mm. that I hadn't seen all of their work, but it's impossible to see of course, everything. Of um and I wouldn't say that there's movies I'm ashamed of not no. having seen. I haven't seen that many Scorsese films. Really? Mm. Okay. I've seen the usual of yeah, course yeah. you know, the mean streets and mm. so forth. But I haven't seen the other ones mm. that he's made. Mm. And I know that he's probably very proud of those mm. those films. Well, the more recent ones like The Departed and things like that. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be ashamed of no, not no, seeing sure. them yeah, because sure. because it's so difficult to keep up of with course. everything. Um, as soon as you find a Shane Meadows, then you want to say, okay, well, I need to see uh, his films. and. Well, may, may, uh, maybe a different way of going at this question. You know so many people in this industry. Are there any friends of yours films that you're ashamed you haven't oh seen oh god i couldn't i couldn't <laughs> <admit> <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I all could of them <laughs> I, I i couldn't admit that um i i found <laughs> i found one thing that i try not to do is if somebody makes a great film or gives a great performance i try to resist not saying that was incredible mm. because then the next time if it isn't mm. You have to say, well, I I can't be. You know, I can't praise of one course, and yeah, not praise course, the other. If an course. actor gives a great performance in this, uh, then why didn't you say something good about the last one yeah. or the ones that's coming up? So, um, I tend to be very quietly supportive of friends because I know how difficult it is mm -hmm. to uh, to make a film mm -hmm. to get a film made. It's are there any films of yours just very quickly that you that maybe didn't do so well critically or commercially that you think should have done more or you feel like a special place for that you really enjoy doing or you think is really really good well i think that's the definition some people say what's the favorite movie that you've done they're not necessarily the best ones mm. 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 um you can have a fantastic time on a film yeah and it can turn out to be terrible mm. you can have a fantastic time on a film it turns out to be great mm. you can never predict it mm. but i've worked on films that i've loved doing and loved working on uh with directors and other actors and they haven't turned out so well but i regard them with great mm. fondness mm. you know my earliest memory of you is when i was when man in the iron mask came out yeah i was about nine 1988 yes. i think it was and yeah I when Woolworths was still around. Right. I got it for Christmas, but leading up to that, I would go in and I'd look at it every time I went in and pick it up, and I've still got the VHS of it yeah. at home. And, and I that that, that was one of those films yeah. that I really loved doing yeah. because it was a spectacular cast, yeah. and uh, we were in Paris for five mm. months, and every day was just a joy to mm. go to work. Mm. Similarly with Usual Suspects, where we just had a laugh, mm. or we shot the whole thing in 27 days, I wow. think. And it was just a laugh from beginning yeah. to end. There's a scene in the beginning of Usual Suspects where mm. you're all standing in the lineup, mm. and 
Benicio del Toro. Uh, no, no, it's Steve Baldwin. Mm. Uh, does the ah, mm. all that mm. kind of thing? Was mm. that like genuine laughter that came out there? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just after launch, and uh, Brian Singer, the director, said, "Well, we're, we're going to do this scene, and then we're going to pick up some stuff later on in the evening. So we'll do the lineup, and we'll just move the camera from one to the other." And they improvised the scenes between Chris McQuarrie, the writer, mm -hmm. who's now a big director, mm. um, and um, Kevin Pollock. They improvised the whole thing of, uh, we can put you in Queens at four o'clock mm. on the day. Then we're, uh, well, I live in Queens. Do you have a team of monkeys working on that? <laughs> that was all Kevin Pollock. And then it came around to that thing. And w we were just um, cracking up and being giddy. Mm. And uh, Singer was really um, frustrated and almost angry that he couldn't get the shot because we couldn't. Yeah. Every time we tried to do it, somebody would start laughing. And eventually he left it in the film because he said right. it was a really great shorthand way of saying these men all know each other yeah. and they're at ease with each other and they're, you know, they're a group. And it was a great way of showing this camaraderie between them mm. um but um yeah n n that was um that was g great fun to do mm. so much good so much fun that i remember the sound guy said you know this is never going to cut together this is just all bullshit this mm. thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah are there stories like that you'd like to have kept in your book that you you missed out because obviously you've, you've you've generally spoken about your life rather than the mm. films that you've done, mm. which has mm. been excellent. It's mm. been a really good mm. direction to go mm. in. Are there any stories in that you'd like to have included? Well, I mean, you could write your entire life, yeah, couldn't you? I mean, ha you have to cut things out. Yeah, and leave well, things out. well um, there was a book that came out, I think it was in the late 90s, by a woman, a producer, a famous producer called Julia Phillips, who wrote a book called You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again. <laughs> And in which she said, I'm going to just, I'm just going to write the truth about everybody mm. that I've worked with. Mm. And she never did work really? in Hollywood again because she just pointed to where all the sure. bodies were buried and sure. said, look. So um, when I initially thought about writing a book, I had talked to um, in a publisher about it. And what they wanted was one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, you know, I've worked with almost everybody mm. in the business, directors, actors, actresses. And I could have done mm. um, You'll Never Eat Lunch in This mm. Town Again. Mm. And you wouldn't have. Uh, and I wouldn't have. Mm. And I would have been one of the bodies buried mm. under the... You couldn't do that to people, really. No, I, I couldn't do it. No, sure. Like, I could tell all the all the stories from behind the scenes of people at their most vulnerable mm. at the parts that they might not want could tell all those stories and uh i didn't want to do that that's fair mm. Mm. it's a great book and lots of lessons in there uh, it makes me feel nostalgic reading it i was saying to charlie today it's like as if we're going to speak to gabriel and we're actually gonna be reading like this actually happened it's not just yeah. a story yeah but it's excellent and i recommend anyone yeah anyone like to read it like i've had the chance to speak to you out of here and uh, I'd come to you regularly and be like, I've just listened to this part <laughs> of the book. I loved it. Or yeah. the ending like, yeah. broke my heart. Yeah. Mm. It, it's it's, it's mm. very raw. Mm. It's very personal. Mm. And definitely should be listened to or mm. read. Listen to definitely if you want to yeah. listen to Gabriel's yeah. dulcet yeah. tones in your okay, ears. Okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's, um, that's wonderful to know. Um it's been critically very, very well received. Yeah. And I'm glad I didn't go the route that you're talking about. Of course, about. of course. Mm. It definitely mm. makes it for a refreshing read. Yeah, yeah, because then you'd have to be very careful. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly you find yourself working with somebody you're sure. telling a story sure. about. This part where we go, there's a red dot on your <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Very good. But, uh, well, Gabriel. Thank you again. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you thank so you. much.